All right, so we're going to talk about sexually transmitted diseases. Um, yesterday I did pregnancy and vaginal bleeding. And um, I haven't really gotten out of the underpants yet, apparently. This is my, my area of expertise. So tomorrow, though, I get to talk about environmental disorders. So I'm very excited to get out of the underpants and do something different. So, all right. So we're going to talk about sexually transmitted infections. And there's really kind of two overarching themes when it comes to sexually transmitted infections. There are those that cause lesions and ulcers and those that cause discharge and don't really cause lesions. So this little chart here kind of breaks down these two categories, um, those things that are not ulcerating things like gonorrhea, chlamydia, etc., that cause discharge or dysuria, and things that cause actual ulcers on the other side, which includes your herpes, your chancroid, etc. You see that syphilis lives on both sides of the line, and that's because syphilis does a lot of different things, which we'll talk about in a few slides. So let's start with our good friend gonorrhea. Um, gonorrhea likes to travel around with chlamydia, they're best friends, and so you should, when you think of one, you think of the other, and we usually treat both together just because of the high rate of co-infection. So chlamydia co-infects with gonorrhea about a third to half of the time. It's very infectious, we see it a lot in adolescents and young adults. In men, it causes pretty significant discharge, copious discharge, and dysuria. Men know that they have it, but sometimes women don't. It does cause cervicitis, it does cause a discharge, but sometimes women don't know that they have it, so it's a little bit sneakier in women. Um, you can also see gonorrhea in the rectum, so you see proctitis and pharyngitis. Those are rare presentations, but should be on your differential for pharyngitis. Gonococcus is a, is a possibility. And if you have gonococcus in the eye that causes conjunctivitis, this is a very serious thing. It causes a lot of discharge. You just have pus literally pouring out of the eye. And Dr. Clower talked about that yesterday in his ophthalmology talk. Um, and certainly gonorrhea can cause PID and it can disseminate, which we'll talk a little bit more about. What about testing for gonorrhea? Well, you can really go two routes with this. One is to send it for your typical good old gram stain and culture. But these days, in terms of screening for GC and chlamydia, we tend to send nucleic acid tests on the urine, which has been kind of a, a nice thing. So you send a urine sample, and they can do nucleic acid amplification looking for GC and chlamydia. So that's one way also to test for gonorrhea. In terms of treating it, there has been a change in the recommendations um, for treating gonococcus in the last year or so, and it's reflected here on this slide. Um, if you're treating gonococcus, you're treating with ceftriaxone or rocephin, 250 milligrams IM, and you also treat with azithro. Now, we used to give it with azithro to cover for chlamydia as well, but it turns out that gonococcus is starting to show resistance. It's showing resistance to quinolones, but it's also had some case reports of resistance to uh, suffixine, which which is an oral cephalosporin, which is treated, used sometimes to treat gonococcus. So there were these case reports of resistance to suffixime, and so they changed the recommendations and added azithro one gram to be given in addition to your ceftriaxone to be uh, covering all of those possible resistant uh, gonococcal species. Now, on the CDC uh, recommendations, they actually admit that there hasn't been in the United States any actual failures of cephalosporin when it comes to treating uh, gonococcus. But just in case, they've added a new recommendation to add a gram of azithro to your ceftriaxone IM injection. If you have conjunctivitis, it's a little bit of a higher dose, a gram IM, and some of those patients may need to be admitted for ophthalmologic care since they really will have copious pus draining out of their eye. It is not your standard bacterial conjunctivitis. It's impressive. So gonorrhea can disseminate. It doesn't do this very commonly, but it can do it about 1% of the time, about that. And when it does disseminate, it likes to go to the joints and it likes to go to tendons. So it also likes to go to the skin and causes some skin lesions. So in patients that have, especially young adults, adolescents, who have fever and arthralgias and have a migratory polyarthritis affecting multiple different joints or a septic arthritis, you certainly have to think about gonococcus as a possible cause for septic arthritis in your young adults um, and in all adults. Tenocetivitis is another uh, way that it can disseminate and it can cause these skin lesions. This is a picture of one on a foot. These are often called gunmetal gray lesions because they have this hemorrhagic pustule and this erythematous base. It tends to go to the lower extremities and it has this kind of classic gunmetal gray appearance to it. Um, there's some debate about whether or not it uh, is a higher risk of dissemination during menses and pregnancy. That's a little controversial. Um, certainly you would want to gram stain these things, any lesions. And when you're asking your review of systems of patients who come in with this type of our 
arthritis or a septic arthritis, you have to ask about uh, genital discharge, and in some cases a pelvic exam would be indicated in those patients to look for gonococcus as a source for your arthritis. The treatment, if you do have disseminated GC, is also a rocephin, again, ceftriaxone, a gram a day for 10 to 14 days. And if you think that it could be disseminated gonococcus, the recommendation is just to treat. Just go ahead and treat and be generous with the rocephin if you think that they might have disseminated GC. Okay, moving on to chlamydia. We talked about how gonococcus and chlamydia are best friends. They like to go everywhere together. So chlamydia is very similar. Uh, it's the most common STD in the United States, the most common. It also causes urethritis and cervicitis, but it's much less symptomatic than gonorrhea. And usually women, especially who have chlamydia, don't know that they have it. And this causes a very high rate of complications in women, including PID and scarring, and it's a risk factor for later ectopic pregnancy. Chlamydia is also diagnosed by nucleic acid test testing like with gonococcus, and we treat chlamydia with azithromycin one gram, or you can do doxy, 100 milligrams orally twice a day for seven days. Don't forget to offer treatment to partners or at least you know, encourage uh, patients to have their partners treated as well. So you have two treatment options for chlamydia. Now let's talk about PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. It's a very general term, inflammation of the pelvis. What is that? It's a very kind of wastebasket term for when you get an infection in the uterus and tubes, it's pelvic inflammatory disease. It doesn't really point you to an organism, it's more of a clinical syndrome. So when you get an infection of the endometrium or the tubes or in combination, we call this PID. You can also have a tubo ovarian abscess in this uh, case as well. And the problem here is that if we don't find it in treat it. It's a common cause of infertility and, and, and fallopian tube scarring. So it can be caused by multiple organisms. Any of these STDs that we're talking about can lead to PID. And the presentation of PID can be very variable. It can, come, can vary from very mild symptoms all the way to someone who looks really sick. So it's a very wide spectrum. And it's a clinical diagnosis. The goal is to try to treat the mild disease and make sure that in the sick patients we're treating the right thing as well. So in terms of diagnosing PID, you really only have to have clinical findings. You gotta have cervical motion tenderness or some kind of uterine tenderness or a nexal tenderness. And if you have those things with some discharge or suspicion, you're pretty much talking about PID. So it's a clinical diagnosis. If you think you have PID, you're gonna send off all those tests that you want to send to confirm whether or not it's gonococcus, chlamydia, et cetera, thinking about HIV and syphilis, and you're gonna treat for PID. If someone looks pretty sick with this, they've got a lot of cervical motion tenderness, they're tachycardic, their belly's particularly tender, they're a little sicker than the average bear, you may need imaging. And they mention here ultrasound and CT. Uh, either one of those is acceptable. Ultrasound is probably preferable because you can see the uterus and the ovarian structures better with an ultrasound than you can with CT. Now, in terms of PID and treating patients, this is an area where some of them are going to get admitted and some of them can go home. It really depends on how the patient in front of you looks, what their comorbidities are, whether they're pregnant, that kind of thing. So sick patients or people who can't keep meds down or they're non-compliant, those people we, we keep in-house. Um, and people who've been on outpatient uh, drugs and are failing or have a TOA, someone who has an abscess, that person comes in. Um, and in terms of what antibiotics to choose with PID, there's a bunch of different possible regimens. A couple of them are mentioned here. You're basically covering your gonococcus and your chlamydia. Uh, you may add flagell. They do point out here that certainly azithromycin alone is not adequate to treat PID because you also have other organisms that aren't totally covered by azithromycin. Um, but looking it up, if you just Google CDC PID, it'll list you all these different choices, including choices for people who have beta-lactam allergies, etc. So there's a bunch of different options there. So let's move on to another friend of ours, which is herpes. And herpes is a very, very common STD in the United States. It's the most common ulcerating STD in the United States. So if you see someone with a painful ulcer type lesion, it's more likely to be herpes than anything else. About 20% of sexually active adults are infected with herpes. So a very, very common, common infection. Um, when you're talking about genital herpes, it's more common to be HSV2 than HSV1. 
one, but it's not exclusively HSV2, but it's more commonly HSV2. And when you first get herpes, the first time you get it, the initial infection, you have systemic symptoms that go with it. People pretty much feel like crap. They have myalgias and malaise, and they might have a little fever. They don't feel well, not to mention they have a painful lesion that's about to happen. So in the first episode, they have a lot of systemic symptoms. Those tend to not be as common as they have recurrences, but certainly with the first outbreak, they can not feel well in addition to the lesions. So with herpes, um, the primary lesion uh, happens a few days after contact. It's a shallow, very painful vesicle that's clustered on an erythematous base, and then it ulcerates. They can also coalesce. These can be pretty impressive when you've seen these. Sometimes they're single lesions, sometimes there's multiple. They can be very, very, very painful. The local symptoms kind of peak at about a week, so they last for a while, and it takes a few weeks for them to really heal and go away. And you can really be shedding virus at any time, including when you're recurring or even when you're in an asymptomatic period. It's more, less likely to be shedding during an asymptomatic period, but not down to a 0% chance. So in terms of diagnosing herpes, if you see somebody that has a lesion, you think it might be herpes, this is a clinical diagnosis. We don't usually send viral cultures or viral stains, but uh, you can do viral testing in women who you really want to confirm the diagnosis, for example. Um, most people will have a, sym a symptomatic recurrence in the first year after their primary infection. A little over half will have a, a symptomatic recurrence. And often when the recurrence is coming on, as it is with other herpes virus type infections, they can have a prodrome where they feel some burning or some paresthesias or some itching or something feels neurologically a little weird that happens in the nerve before the outbreak happens. And that happens with herpes uh, genitalis as well. In terms of treatment, like with herpes in other places, there's no actual cure, but we do offer treatment to patients to reduce the symptom duration, to make them feel a little bit better, and to reduce the relapse rate. And certainly patients who have a bunch of recurrences will go on prophylactic therapy that's pretty normal. So they can offer them one of the following, the acyclovir, valcyclovir, famcyclovir, any of those are acceptable, but the topical antiviral treatments are really not effective. Um, depending on how, if it's a recurrence infection or a prophylactic, prophylactic dose or an initial infection, there are different dosing regimens for these things that you can check. Herpes does have some complications besides just genital ulcers. Herpes can lead to a lot of other things. Um, meningitis, they can lead to a radiculopathy syndrome. It can rarely lead to hepatitis. Encephalitis, herpes encephalitis uh, is on the list of you know, things to consider when you have someone with altered mental status. Um, transverse myelitis, all these complications are rare, but on the list of things that can happen to patients who have herpes. So let's move on to syphilis. Um, syphilis, if, as you remember, is, has three different phases. There's primary syphilis, there's secondary syphilis, and then tertiary syphilis that happens way down the road. So let's kind of cover those three different phases. Um, syphilis, if you remember, is caused by a spirochete. It's called treponema pallidum. Um, it's, a, it's not a very smart organism because it's still sensitive to penicillin, which we'll get to, um, but it's been around for a long, long time. Syphilis is one of our oldest STDs. Um, and the primary infection of syphilis often people miss it because it's a painless ulcer. So the chancre of syphilis is a painless ulcer, and so often people either don't seek treatment or don't recognize it because it doesn't cause them any pain, so it's pretty easy to kind of ignore. It's a painless, indurated, demarcated lesion with a red base um, that will go away in about four to eight weeks after it first happens. Um, there's a long incubation pe period that's about a month, um, and if you're going to test for syphilis, you would send it for dark field microbes microscopy to look for the spirochete, or you will send a serum test, which would be an RPR or a v, uh, VDRL, are the two uh, most commonly used serum tests. Those are pretty, those are sensitive tests, but they're not necessarily specific, so they often have to be followed up with a more specific test if one of those comes back positive. Okay, in terms of secondary syphilis, after the chancre comes and goes, if syphilis is not treated, patients can enter into secondary syphilis. And this can happen anywhere from two to 10 weeks after the chancre, the primary syphilis has happened. It often presents with a rash, but the thing about syphilis, which is often called the great imitator, is it can look like lots of things, and it can fool you. Syphilis can present in lots of different ways. One of the ways that it can present is to have this nonspecific maculopapular rash that sometimes is on the palms and soles, but sometimes it's not. It can cause some fevers. It can cause a little bit of joint pain. These things are pretty common, hard to pin down to syphilis unless you think about it. Condylomalata they mention here, which is um, a wart, but it's kind of a flat uh, wart, 
instead of kind of a heaped up wart, like a HPV type wart, it's a flatter wart that happens sometimes in moist areas. It can happen around the anus. It can happen in skin folds. That's condyloma lata. Um, and it can also cause painless lymphadenopathy as well. Now, if you don't catch secondary syphilis there, and one thing about secondary syphilis to keep in mind is you've probably seen lots of patients that have rashes like this. So sometimes when you see patients with rashes that you're not sure where it's coming from, think about syphilis. Think about asking some questions that might, in terms of risk factors for syphilis, think about sending an RPR. It's one of those things that can masquerade when it's a rash, you're not really sure what it, what it is. Um, that's the rash. It's not a pruritic rash in general. Now, after secondary syphilis, if we don't catch it there, there's a latent period that can be years and years and years, and then they can present with tertiary syphilis. And this can be a lot of different things. It can be a neurologic manifestation, something like a meningitis. It can be a cause of dementia. When we're working at patients for dementia and we think about medical causes for new onset dementia, syphilis is on that list. And so sending an RPR for those kind of new, new uh, dementia patients is common to see if this might be it. It can also cause cardiovascular problems like aneurysms and aortic insufficiency. It can cause problems with the joints, the Charcot joint, and some skin lesions. So tertiary syphilis can have a lot of different presentations. It can be years down the line, um, and it's, uh, it can happen because we don't pick it up often from the primary or the secondary forms. Now, how do we treat syphilis? We still treat it with penicillin. Good old penicillin works for syphilis. There's no resistance. So the spirochete is still sensitive to penicillin. So it's a 2.4 million unit IM dose of penicillin for primary and secondary syphilis. Tertiary syphilis, we still treat with penicillin, but they have more frequent dosing. There are, all, there are alternatives. So if you have a penicillin allergic patient, you can use doxy or ceftriaxone or erythromycin are all acceptable. And for those patients who do get penicillin, they can get what it's called a Jerish Herxheimer reaction, which is the penicillin attacking the spirochete and the spirochete kind of exploding. That's how I think about it. And then this endotoxin that causes them to get sick. They can get fever, they can get joint pain, they cannot feel well, and that's a Jerish Herxheimer reaction, which is like I think about it, the little war inside the body of the penicillin attacking the spirochete. And this happens about half the time when you treat someone that has primary syphilis um, and a little more commonly in someone who has secondary syphilis. So Jerich Herxheimer reaction, reaction common with treatment of syphilis. Now here's two that are a little more rare, a little more uncommon, a little more exotic, if you will. Uh, Chancroid and LGV. Um, these are really not that common in US, but they're more common in developing worlds. So that if you have someone that comes in with these things and who's been to a developing country like sex tourism to Thailand or somewhere else, this may be something that they bring home with them that they didn't quite ask for. So this is, chancroid is multiple painful genital ulcers plus you have an inguinal node, which you call a bubo, and this is chancroid. There's a picture of it there. This is a clinical diagnosis of an ulcer plus an lymphadenopathy in the right kind of patient. Uh, this caused by Haemophilus ducri is the organism, um, and you treat it with azithromycin uh, in terms if you think that this is what you've got. The other one to mention is LGV, lymphogranuloma venereum. This is caused by chlamydia. It's a, really a disease of the lymphatics, as evidenced by the L in LGV. It's um, it's a painless ulcer, but it can get into the lymphatics and cause this major adenopathy and this major lymphatic swelling, and that's LGV. These are uncommon diseases, but when you see patients with abscesses or masses in the groin, you have to think about chancroid and LGV as a possible cause. So, a couple summary slides here that you have in your uh, book there to kind of compare the ones we've just talked about, their common and uncommon features, herpes, syphilis, chancroid, and LGV. They talk about those that have, uh, the only one that really can have a systemic illness where someone doesn't feel well in general is herpes, and that's usually with the primary infection. Then we talk a little about the characteristics of the adenopathy that would go with each one of these conditions, what the initial lesion might look like, and what the lesions in general might look like. I think one of the really differentiating things is the fact that with syphilis, for example, if you're seeing a patient with a genital ulcer, syphilis is painless. That's really important because herpes is certainly not painless. It's very painful. So differentiating whether they have pain, what the ulcer is like, whether there's associated adenopathy, all those things can help you differentiate clinically one condition from another. Okay, so transitioning from those STDs to some more uh, GYN conditions, some of these will still be STDs, but let's talk a little about vulvovaginitis, patients who come in with a chief complaint of vulvar or vaginal pain or inflammation, what the etiologies of that could be. 
So patients who come in with discharge and irritation. Now this could be an infection, but don't forget that someone that has vulvar or vaginal irritation can also have one of these other conditions. It could be an allergy. It could be an allergy to a new soap, something like that. It could be a vaginal foreign body. It could be atrophic vaginitis, very common in postmenopausal women because of a lack of estrogen. And sometimes estrogen creams can help that, but that can also be a cause of, of vulvovaginitis. It's a very common gynecological complaint, and so what are the possible etiologies? Let's get into that. Well, one of the more common ones is candida, candidiasis, a yeast infection. This is about a quarter of the vulvovaginitis, and most women, 75% of women in their lifetime at some point will have a candidal infection, and that's because there's some pretty common etiologies for it. Most of these are caused by candida albicans, which is part of the normal flora, um, but if you have these risk factors, you can have an overgrowth. So the most common one is diabetes, and this can be a common way that diabetes presents for the very first time is with a yeast infection, with a candidal infection in a female, or balanitis in a male. If you see women, women or men that have a yeast infection, you gotta check a sugar. Think about the fact that this could be an initial presentation of diabetes. Oral contraceptives can do it. Antibiotics is a really common one that alters the normal flora, and you get a candidal overgrowth, and pregnancy as well. So how does it present? Well, you get a vulvar pruritus. It can be kind of a common symptom of itching, can be pretty intense. There can be a discharge. There could be dyspareunia. There can be dysuria. The dysuria of candidal infections is a little different than that of UTIs because you don't have that frequency that goes with it, but you do have this burning that comes from the urine kind of hitting these irritated vulva areas. Um, and so that's a part of the presentation. And you'll see these very red, beefy vulva. You can see edema, sometimes some excoriations, and you can see this cottage cheese. They call it a cottage cheese discharge. It doesn't always look like that, but it can be a white discharge that's not really odorous in general. Um, and that's the typical, the typical description. So if you're going to do a wet mount, you'll see the pseudohyphae, you'll see the yeast. Sometimes you'll get that report back on a wet mount that you sent for some other reason. But we don't treat patients if they're not symptomatic. So if you get, for example, a wet mount back and the patient really didn't have any complaints of vulvar, vulvovaginitis, you did the wet mount for some other reason and they're not symptomatic, you don't necessarily treat the yeast because yeast is a normal flora. It just is, uh, can overgrow and cause this vulvovaginitis. But if you are going to treat it, you can treat it with fluconazole, diflucan, a single dose, 150 milligrams PO, except when patients are pregnant. And then you have to use a topical treatment. And you can use a topical treatment if someone prefers it, um, if they'd rather not take the systemic, um, the systemic diflucan. And there's a bunch of different options that you can use, suppositories, vaginal tablets, to treat the candida. Let's talk about trick for a minute, trichomoniasis. This is a protozoa. This causes about 10% of infectious vaginitis. This is an STD. So it is a vulvovaginitis, but it is transmitted sexually. And a presentation can be everything from pretty asymptomatic to pelvic pain to paritis and irritation to some discharge as well, a frothy or fishy discharge. And if you look on exam, the, one of the classic uh, physical exam findings is what they call a strawberry cervix, which you see a picture here, which is kind of these little punctate submucosal hemorrhages that kind of look like a strawberry. This is not that common. You see that the incidence is only 2 to 10%, but if you do see a strawberry cervix, that's pretty classic for trichomi trichomonas. Um, and then you're going to take wet mount swabs. You're going to send that to the lab, and they're going to report that there are trichomonids there, that there are modal protozoa, and that's how you know that it's trich. The treatment for trichomonas is flagyl or metronidazole. Uh, you can also use this other, this other drug, tenidazole, as well. Metronidazole is the more common one that we pick. Um, and you can use metronidazole throughout pregnancy, but if you have somebody who uh, that, that is pregnant, you can't use tenidazole. You, you can only use the flagyl in someone who's pregnant. If you have someone who's had recalcitrant or recurrent trick, you can use this other drug as well. But don't forget that one common reason for that, if they're recalcitrant or recurrent, is that their partner hasn't been treated. So they're infecting each other over and over again. So when you diagnose trichomonas, you should offer or at least educate that the partner also needs treatment or else it'll keep getting passed back and forth. So it's transmitted sexually, you gotta treat both part partners in this thing. 
Okay, bacterial vaginosis, BV. Let's talk about that. This is a pretty common one. About a third of patients that complain of vaginal discharge will have BV. Uh, this is basically in the normal flora kind of gone wild. So you've got Gardnerella and anaerobes that normally live there, but again, kind of like Canada, this is a situation where the normal vaginal flora kind of gets imbalanced and you get bacterial vaginosis. And this is not an STD. This doesn't necessarily, it's not associated with diabetes. It's just something that happens. Um, the vaginal exam may often be normal, but they have this discharge. They may have a fishy or an ammonia-like odor on exam. And the CDC says that you need three of the four criteria to diagnose bacterial vaginosis. Um, they include things like clue cells, which come back on your um, wet mount that you send, which are the epithelial cells that have the little bacteria stuck to them. They look like little potato chips with little dots on them. A copious white discharge, that's often why they came in, that's the chief complaint. And then they also talk about having an abnormal vaginal pH or a fishy odor with the KOH test, which is pretty uncommon to use that as a test. Most people would kind of use number one and number two to make a diagnosis of BV. We treat people who are symptomatic. If they've come in for a vaginal discharge and you have clue cells on your wet mount, you're gonna treat those people. And we treat people who are pregnant because bacterial vaginosis can lead to some bad pregnancy outcomes. So those patients get treated too. And you can choose to treat or not treat asymptomatic women. If clue cells comes back on your wet mount and they don't really have a discharge, it's kind of up to you to decide whether or not to treat. But the treatment for uh, bacterial vaginosis is also flagellar or metronidazole, 500 milligrams twice a day for seven days. And whether they're pregnant or non-pregnant, it's safe in pregnancy. And you can use a metronidazole gel if you prefer to go that route or if your patient prefers to go that route. So here's another little summary chart going through our vulvovaginitis organisms, the things we just talked about, the BV, the trick, the candida, and what the incidence of different symptoms are, whether or not they have erythema and discharge on their exam. And so you can go through that and kind of review all the different highlights of things we talked about. This also goes to the diagnostic testing and how they differentiate one from another. Clue cells is bacterial vaginosis. The trichomonads, the little modal protozoa, that's that's trichomonas, so, sorry, the clue cells is BV, uh, the trichomonas is trick, and the yeast forms is candida, and that's all here in the chart there. Um, the only one that's actually an STD is trichomonas. That's an STD where you gotta treat both partners. So the last couple of concepts here are just general GYN concepts that don't really appear anywhere else, so we kind of threw them in the STDs, even though this is not an STD. Uh, they can sometimes have gonococcus and chlamydia as organisms, but that's not really what Bartholin cysts are. Bartholin cysts are normal uh, glands that can get blocked, and they can come, patients can come in with a chief complaint of vaginal mass or vaginal pain, and on exam, you're going to find these blocked cysts, these blocked ducts, and these abscesses. So it's right at the vaginal introitus. You see a picture of it here. They're usually at about 4 o'clock or 8 o'clock at the bottom of the introitus. These very, very painful swollen areas. These can just be a cyst or they can get super infected and become an abscess. If it is an abscess, it's just like abscesses in other parts of the body where the treatment is IND. You got to open it up. Um, there can be lots of different mixed flora there. There can be anaerobic bacteria. There can be um, gonococcus or chlamydia as well. But we're going to IND this and we're going to use a word catheter if you have these. Word catheters are nice because they allow the, the abscess to kind of remain open and sort of heal over time. So a word catheter is almost like a little mini, it looks like a little tiny, tiny little mini Foley catheter almost with a little balloon at the end that you insert into the uh, abscess cavity and you inflate the little balloon at the end and it stays in for several weeks until they follow up with GYN. You don't have to use a word catheter, but it's kind of a nice little trick, nice little tool to use with these Bartholin abscesses because they tend to recur if they don't stay open. If they do keep coming back, you refer them to GYN. They need a marsupialization or kind of a different procedure to get rid of this little gland, this little cyst, so it doesn't keep coming back. A couple other things here. This has to do with uh, warts, condyloma, condyloma cuminata. This is HPV infection. These are also called venereal warts. You can find them in the perineum, the penis, or perirectal areas. These aren't painful, so often patients aren't complaining of any kind of pain. They're mostly cosmetic, or you may just see them when you're examining them for some other condition. These are usually painless. They can cause a little discomfort, but usually not really. They're kind of cauliflower-like bumps. They're raised 
used and they're treated topically. You can refer them uh, for treatment. They can also be treated with, 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 uh, with nitrogen, frozen nitrogen freezing type treatments as well. So they need to be referred for those types of treatments. You, can, you can't really treat it any other way. You can prevent it by vaccinating people for HPV, which is a new vaccine that's available. And in fact, the CDC recommends this vaccine for young women. Um, and then again, we're gonna refer them if we find these warts and the patient desires treatment. So the last concept here is about sexual assault and treating patients uh, who have been sexually assaulted. Um, this is a pretty complicated process, and the reason this is included here is to uh, address it in terms of treating for STDs. Um, certainly, the evaluation and, uh, and dealing with a patient who's had a sexual assault is a complicated process. It's not a simple exam, the forensic exam. It's not a simple emotional situation either. Many of you may be trained in how to deal with sexual assault um, patients. Often, you work at a place that has a sexual assault response team for this very purpose because there's a lot to deal with. Um, there are guidelines on, on treating patients um, who have been sexually assaulted. These are not all listed here for you, but they're easily found on the CBC website. In general, the concepts here in terms of STDs are to send samples for testing. The nucleic acid tests uh, for chlamydia and GC can be uh, used. You can also send a wet mount looking for the other types of uh, transmitted infections like trichomonas. Um, and you can send serology for the hepatitis and HIV as well. All of these things have to be thought about and the sample sent for text testing. We also treat people who've had sexual assault. We treat them to make sure in case this, this has happened to them and they have contracted an STD that they have coverage. So they're treated with ceftriaxone. They're also covered with flagell. We also give them azithromycin and they can be offered herpes, herpes prophylaxis as well, although it's not a guaranteed protectant, but it can also be offered additionally. Hepatitis vaccine can also be offered. The last slide here also addresses the issue of HIV transmission and sexual assault. And <clears throat> this is a very, very low risk thing to have happen in a sexual assault, but it's not zero. So often, and patients can be very, very concerned about it, which is very understandable. So evaluating what the assault, how it went down in terms of whether or not there was any bleeding involved, that would increase your risk for HIV transmission. If you're thinking about offering post-exposure prophylaxis, there's some education that has to go along with that to explain that it's not 100% protective. It can also have a lot of side effects, and you may have a process in your institution on consulting with your HIV consultant or ID consultant in terms of offering this treatment. Not 100% offered. It's something to discuss, but it is on the menu of possible things. I'm out of time. Thank you very much.